Uh, Emma and I are representing Arkansas Early Childhood Association today, and you'll hear us talk about the association and what um, the focus is a lot. Um, but I also want to point out that we have been uh, Kids Health members and partners with Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families for about 20 years, informally as well as formally, um, in, in, in that we have a memorandum of understanding even, right? So they, they are kind of um, an arm to our association, so to speak, and so work closely with them. And happy, really excited to be part of this conversation. Emma and I talked briefly this morning uh, to have early childhood be its own sector conversation compared to K-12 and health. When you think about how broad those are that we really get to narrow down to a very specific group of young children. So really honored to be here and my co-host, Miss Emma. Hi everybody, I'm Emma Tempest, like Gina said, I'm the VP of Communications for AICA and we are so excited about what we've got to share with you. So I just saw Anne's uh, chat that said like we started when we were 12. Yes, and this that that chat is a very good example of one of the reasons I'm so excited to be here today. Because the first thing when uh, when Rebecca opened up the waiting room, like two people I knew just right off the bat. So I miss that we're not all together at the Capitol today, but there have been those uh, kid count days at the Capitol where it was freezing cold. So now we're in the comfort of our space, wherever that is. And I, those, um, those marble floors are heck on your feet all day too. So none of that today, everything is virtual. So um, I'm gonna do the first half of our conversation. Ms. Emma's gonna take it from there. So Emma, the next slide, please. Um, our general agenda is uh, the who's who's and what's what. So one of the things that we're gonna focus on the first part of our presentation is really about funding that goes into early education. Cause I think it's a little complicated to advocate when you're not really sure who to advocate to. Um, we kind of, we may have a pretty good idea of what we're advocating for, but who do we advocate to? So in early education uh, in Arkansas, we are here because of a state legislative process going on right now, but there's actually a lot of congressional emphasis on our work. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and try to demystify that. And so if you have a specific question about the who's who and the what's what of early childhood regarding funding and regulations, uh, please put that in the chat. So Emma's going to track that as I talk about it. And if I anything that I don't cover, she's going to make sure she calls out before we trade spots. The other thing we're going to touch upon is correcting public perception. So I know there's a lot of people on this uh, Zoom meeting that are in the field, um, and a lot of us have had a lot of conversations about how we don't understand how people think we're still babysitting, right? Infant brain development's been talked about in 1999. It was the cover of Newsweek and the cover of Times, how come everybody doesn't get it, right? So we're going to talk about that problem and then how we might go about correcting it. Um, and then as Rebecca said, Emma's gonna focus the last half of our conversations on strategies for change, specifically just how we do what we already know how to do, but maybe with a particular audience in mind that we haven't given as much thought about and stronger and louder together, right? So instead of having these separate conversations, how do we have more of a collective conversation so that we can see that change? We also wanna give a big shout out for, um, those of you who have joined us who are not colleagues, you're not early educators, you're not part of the sector and just care so much about it that you wanted to come and hang with us this afternoon. So we welcome you and thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. Ms. Emma? So um, as I mentioned before, what, what are your questions? What are your questions about the who's who and the what's what? Um, we've saved time at the end. So if there's anything that we're not covering within that agenda frame that we hopefully have some time for, um, that's probably what I've enjoyed the most in the sessions I've attended this week with other um, subject matter experts is really hearing from people what their concerns and questions are. So please use that. Emma and I are gonna be monitoring the chat when we're not the one talking, but then Rebecca's helping us with that as well. Next slide. So the who's who and the what's what of early childhood funding, um, it really, next slide, is boils down to two main categories. So Congress um, shares money with the state as well as the Arkansas legislature. Um, 
And all of that funnels to the Arkansas Department of Human Services Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education. So we call it the division, but there's actually 10 divisions under DHS. And I, I purposely mention Department of Human Services um, as part of that context because the division is not just accountable to the field. The division is accountable to the DHS director and the DHS director is accountable to the government and, or the governor. And then the legislators play a role in that. So it's there's a lot of people as far as um, that have kind of a hand in how this process works. So next slide. So by far, the biggest chunk of money we get comes from Congress, not from the state legislature. Um, and that comes in the form of the Child Care Development Fund, often called the CCDF. Um, and just to make things complicated, we also call it the Child Care Development Block Grant. The, the act itself is still referred to as the CCDBG. And you can tell how long I've been talking about this when you can just say CCDBG, like it's one word. Um, is the act itself and it was renewed in 2014. And then the funds that are allocated to the state are referred to as the Child Care Development Fund. So that's really a big emphasis because that's the money that pays for vouchers for families in Arkansas. And it also um, is what the Division of Child Care uses to contract with organizations to provide professional development and other related supports connected to the quality rating improvement system, which in Arkansas, our quality rating improvement system um, is better beginnings. Um, and, it, and it's something to note that in other states, professional development, if we lived in Texas or Tennessee, we'd be paying for it. So our state is making those decisions to provide that professional development opportunity for all licensed program, regardless if you take vouchers or not, which is really the focus of CCDF. It really is about providing resources to families that may not be able to go to work if they didn't have them. And from just a little bit of history, this came from when we decided to um, reorganize the what we called at that time welfare system, right? That childcare advocates at a national level said, yeah, if you're gonna put these work requirements on families, then you've got to give them a way to pay for childcare. It was a new idea to people. Um, and the, so if you understand the purpose of the money is really about getting parents to work, it really isn't about the quality of services they have. Um, other things that come from Congress that are administered through the Division of Child Care, um, well, let me rephrase that. Other, th other money that comes from Congress, Head Start, Early Head Start, there's a piece of that administered by uh, the Division of Child Care, but it, the, most of it goes directly to um, the practitioners through contracts. So it, even when we have a system that you say, oh, this is how it is, it's like, oh, well, this is how it is, except when it's not, and it's this. Um, but the money does come from the federal, um, from it, administrated through Congress to the state. USDA food program. So the, some of the different pieces that if I'm running a program, I could be licensed and receiving some professional development. I could also be a Head Start and, and receiving funds that way. And I may also be part of the USD food program. So that's another thing that makes us different than other sorts of industries. Because if we were in K-12, there would be there would things that would be come from the state and go to the district and then the district would support the localities we don't have that district right we we are licensed by the division but we don't work for them right we have individual entities that may be nonprofit for profit faith based so it makes this uh, coordination really complicated um, and then other things that come from Congress to the state, and I just phrased it as come and go, and the list is pretty long, but the most recent list is CARES funding that was specifically allocated to child care. And then the, the newest funding that just was um, passed in December, COVID relief, the, they call it two. So not to be confused with CARES, it's a separate pot of money. Emma, next slide. So what does come from our state legislators, um, they have more uh, oversight of the rules and regulations. So there's always guidance that comes from Congress with money, but usually there's a lot of flexibility for each state. You, in fact, you could pull up the 50 minimum licensing requirements for every state in the union and they would look very different. So there's some pros and cons to that, right? Things are different in the South than they are in the North or the East or the West. 
but also then the, that also makes it really tricky for coordination because there's that lack of consistency for things. So um, in Arkansas, we go through a procurement process with our minimum licensing standards that go, runs through the legislature. So they have some oversight on that as well as the um, rules and regs that we have for the quality rating improvement system. When th that was rolled out in 2010, that went through a promulgation process with a legislative committee. The, the thing the state probably has the most impact on our work is appropriations. Um, often related budget, uh, related legislation, like Arkansas Better Chance and Arkansas Better Chance for School Skills, Arkansas Better Chance and Arkansas Better Chance for School Success. Y'all know I can talk all day, so I'm really trying to be mindful of my time so I don't suck into Emma, so I'm just talking faster. So state budget appropriations, that's something that even people may or may not know is that there's actually two different pieces of legislation that roll up under the umbrella that we call ABC or Arkansas Better Chance. The original legislation was passed in the 90s and there was an allocation of 10 and 11 million dollars for that. We advocates, including Arkansas Early Childhood Association and Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families, asked for really an extension of what was somewhat of a pre-K pre program, public pre-K, to become the Arkansas Better Chance for School Success is actually the second piece of legislation. The variables are um, eligibility criteria for the child is the biggest factor, um, and but we in in the field, or if you're a parent, you don't know which one is overseeing which thing, right? So in regulating that, those things have been kind of combined in how we administer it and as well as the budget. Um, so every year, that $113 million that ABC receives to initiate these public pre-K could go away. The budget, the, it is not, um, it is, is not mandated line item in the state budget. And if you think about how poor we are as a state, the amount of revenue we bring in, $113 million we should be really, really proud of. Um, it's served a lot of kids over a lot of time in really high quality programs. But I think it's really important for us to know as advocates that that stays around because it's good, but it doesn't have to, right? So you can't rest on, as we look forward to new things, we can't rest on our laurels and assume things that, good things that are already in place maintain. I couldn't help but to add something in here in that state legislators could do more things. Occasionally they will pass a law that directly affects us, but it's not very common in our state. Um, one example is that there are a couple of different specific pieces of legislation that are rolled into our minimum standards regarding transportation. So if you look at that transportation section on minimum licensing, you'll see that there's two things specifically called out that they're a law. It's not a rule and reg. So in this example, the Division of Child Care couldn't change that. They couldn't give some sort of flexibility or change that rule and reg because it isn't a rule or a regulation, it's actually a law and they're in charge of administering it. So those kind of things happen, but not with a lot of regularity. Future options that we might think about is a state allocation to the vouchers, right? We receive voucher money from Congress. It's never been enough to cover all the eligible children. And in some states in the country, they put in their own state money to make give that a bigger pot of money, right? So those are the kinds of things a state legislator could do if they were inclined to. Um, and two years ago, the, during the last session, Arkansas Early Childhood Association, as well as Arkansas Advocates for Children and Family, um, found a sponsor and put forth legislation for an early ch childhood workforce educational incentive. Uh, and it was modeled on the tax program that um, Louisiana has had in place now, I think it's 13th year, more than 10. Um, and it's it to encourage people to receive and continue their higher education. So you would receive a credit if you had a CDA or an AA or a BA, and as your educational level of obtainment went up, so did your credit. Um, so even if I'm in the tax bracket that um, doesn't pay taxes, which would be a large percentage of our uh, colleagues based on the wages they're earning, I would receive this almost as a bonus annually. So it was a strategy towards a compensation strategy. It wasn't going to fix everybody's paycheck every week, but it would bring money into my household. Um, my example is always like that Dr. 
bill that's hard to pay off or those set of tires you've been putting off, you know, those big chunk of money that I could use with my credit could really help me in my household. It, given the pandemic, and the other uh, seriousness of things going on, it was advised to us that we not put that forward again this year. So we did not. Um, so, but I, I think we have every intention in two years when the state legislatures meet again, that we may put that forward. Emma, next slide. So just to focus a little attention on a couple of big things that are at the state. So Congress is giving money to the Division of Child Care or they give it to the state. It's administered by the Division of Child Care. And the Arkansas legislature oversees some of that. Um, they also give resources to pay for licensing, right? Um, when Child Care Development Block Grant first rolled out, there were states that put their own state resources back into the kitty and use the federal resources to pay for things like licensing. That was never its intention. It was to support on top of what was already being in place. So I, I would like to point out a couple of times this afternoon is that our state really does a good job of administering the resources in the way they're intended, right? To improve and bolster what's already happening in, in the state. Um, so what's happening, and I, I've got a slide to go into more detail, but the the every time the Congress gives us money, it's for a two-year cycle. Like they say, we're going to give the state this much money, and we'd like your plan for that. And so they call it the state plan. Um, and the, the planning process is underway now, sort of. So there is, um, they, Arkansas will need to give that back to the feds by July. Um, but they haven't given them guidance for this year. So they're like, oh, you got to do this plan and we'll tell you in a little while what it is we want you to do. But the information is that it will not change a lot since the previous plan. Um, and just to understand the complicatedness of the plan, basically the Division of Child Care is telling the feds, here's how we're going to spend our $87.5 million. One of the guidelines that they give us is how much of the money that we get has to go where, right? So 3% is a set aside is how it's referred to for infants and toddlers, 9% uh, for quality, 70% for direct services, which we do in the form of vouchers. And so there's, a, there's um, some flexibility, obviously, to make any of those higher, those don't add up to 100. And then how we do that, how we do quality, right, is up to each state. So they will go through that planning process, which is in time for people to advocate on behalf of things that they'd like to see moving forward. Um, and then just to make sure that we're clear that now uh, with the reorg of the state infrastructure uh, in the last session two years ago, Arkansas Better Chance and Arkansas Better Chance for School Success funding now comes through the Department of Ed, not the Division of Child Care. Next slide. So this is a lot of words because it's, it's got, it, it's just a lot of stuff. Um, but I wanted to remind you, or wanted to remind me to tell you, Child Care Development Block Grant, Child Care Development Fund, going through the two-year plan. Um, so expected guidance to come out in April. They call that guidance a preprint. There's a preprint already out floating around uh, based on the previous plan process. It's 118 pages. So it's kind of a fill in the blank that the feds give to the states to say, how are you gonna spend your $87.5 million? Um, so it does, it does, I don't want anything to imply, oh, the division of childcare just has to send their plan. It's a very, it's a very robust plan and it's, and it's pretty detailed. Um, so the state agencies, are required by the feds to have a public hearing. And another thing I'd like to point out is that our state has always had multiple public hearings. I believe the law only requires one and they've always had more than one. Um, and I think that may be even a better time to engage this year because I'm gonna guess they're virtual, right? So much easier to participate and hear what the plan is and to provide feedback when that's asked of you. And they have to give people a 20 day advance notice. So one of the things that AECA will be focusing on in the spring is keeping up with what the process is with the plan and making sure members are aware of when the first draft comes available and how and what opportunities they may have for input. Because thinking that's the biggest chunk of money we get as a field, it happens every other year 
And so if, if you feel strongly about things that are working great, they want to hear that. Like, please keep this going, right? Things that may not be working quite so well, they'd love to hear that and how they might adjust that and something that's missing. I mean, we're in a pandemic. So maybe two years ago when we made the plan, there was a, there's, this wasn't a need and now it is. So um, next slide, Emma. The, I, I couldn't go today without talking about the other money. You know, I said things come and go. And so we had the CARES funding that was passed in the spring and implemented out through the Division of Child Care. It actually, um, just to make things more complicated, there was CARES money that came to the state to be used as it saw fit. And then there was specifically earmarked money through CARES that went straight through the CCDF process. So it went to the same administrator across the country as it would have if it was CCDF or CCDBG, which was super smart of national um, advocates to give it to people who knew what to do with it. Um, and I, I really don't think I can speak loudly enough to praise the Division of Child Care of Arkansas to get the money out as fast as I think was probably possible with as many administrative layers, right? You can't spend the money until you have the letter. You have to go through the Office of Procurement in the state. They don't just start writing checks for $41 million, right? So they were ready when this money came to the state. There are many, many states who have not fully allocated the resources that were given to them. So we, we owe them a lot of credit for that. Um, and these were the major buckets. This was shared during the uh, Divisions Commission meeting last week and took from that document. So things that went to su supplemental voucher payments, sanitation and PPE, one-time maintenance, deep cleaning um, for positive cases, essential worker vouchers, um, and then their total expenditures. And our total expenditures that was given to Arkansas was, um, I had the, it's 42 million plus. So that we are so close <laughs> to have spent every last dime within the time that it was intended to spend that we'll be ready as a state when this next wave of money actually makes it to the state to initiate that as well. Um, and the good news is if you liked how that plan went and how it was effective to your program, if you're leading a program, um, the federal allocation for the initial CARES grant was $41 million. This next wave will have Arkansas at somewhere between 118 to 120. So three times what the money was in the spring and also substantially more than what we get every year. And this would be on top of that, right? The 87.5 that we got things going that we got going. This is on top of that. So when, when you hear things like, please contact Congress and ask them to support the CARES money for childcare, this is the result of that, right? That, that receiving $120 million does not just happen magically, that there were people making sure their congressional members across the country knew the importance and the need to keep our, our sector sustained. Next slide. So all of that to say, um, how come people don't understand how complicated our work is <laughs> and how like we are not just over here babysitting because I did that for a dollar an hour at 16. This is not that, right? And so I, some, those of you who've been in training with me over the years have heard this already, but I'm reminding you or sharing you with others is that in my 28 years in early education, it has come to my realization, the Gina Dickey definition is that people in early ed are special and everybody else is just regular. And it's not their fault that they're just regular. It's regular is not bad, special is just better, right? And so for those of you who are not colleagues in our field, I have learned that people in other sectors can be almost special, that you almost understand everything that we just talked about and almost understand how important the first five years are. Um, and, and I think the other definition of special to me, this teacher was a really good, like I just love that baby's face, even though you can hardly see her face, like the joy and connectedness she has to that adult is that's what makes us special. Like we live for that, we love that. And that children's laughter is like our favorite sound on the planet. That's not how everybody thinks. And I think it's really important for us to know that we're special and that we just know some things other people don't know. And it is then on our, it's, it's up to us to educate the regular people. Emma? 
My favorite quote, and many of you have seen this before, Lily Tomlin, I said, somebody should do something about that. Then I realized I am somebody. Um, so that's really my segue into Emma's sec section of this conversation is that for strategies for change, we're gonna have to teach the regular people and Emma's got some ideas to help us do that. And if we can do that work collectively, then it will be, it's, it, we're gonna get, um, it's louder and more effective. Um, and that's, that's what we hope to do as advocates. So, Ms. Emma. We have a, a lot of questions um, really quick. If you wanna answer a few before we go into the how to advocate section. Um, one question is how do policymakers decide what are good sources of data before making policy decisions? Are research studies considered when making decisions? So I, I think I have two parts to that answer. One, in, in the early years of me starting to hang out at the Capitol and trying to understand how this process works and how you can influence it, I learned that on a typical session, this one will not be that, it may end shorter, so this number may not be as applicable. But in a typical session in Arkansas, our legislators are gonna see more than 2000 pieces of legislation. And they go from everything from juvenile justice to road construction. And so I think it's the, how do they make a decision is probably even more important than what data they use because I think that's where our role becomes so, so critical that me knowing who my legislator is and, and them feeling that I'm a subject matter expert in early childhood, just like the people on this call, that don't underestimate the knowledge you carry around because you're in this field. And don't assume as a legislator who's probably regular that they're going to know what you know. So being a source of information that's their constituent, I think may be the most important, that it's real information. It affects Arkansas kids and Arkansas families and Arkansas employees that you may employ as an administrator. Um, and then it is good to have some data, right? But I, I, what I also have learned and still working on is where I might be super interested in this 60 page Yale study they need the two bullet points. What do I need to know, Gina? Because I got 2,000 other pieces of legislation I need to be educated on too. A, another question is, are there charts that illustrate all these relationships among government agencies? Not to my knowledge. So um, this, I created this PowerPoint just to show this. Uh, and I felt like that a visual to kind of show where these connectedness is, but that certainly may be something we need to think about and how to do that in like an infographic to um, for something that goes beyond today's presentation. That's a, thank you for that question. But no, I couldn't find anything. So what you saw this today is something I created. Um, another one, um, and there's, there's several others. We Maybe we can get to at the end, but what steps has Arkansas taken in the area of nutrition, education, and obesity prevention in early childhood care and education settings? So we've had a diff some different programs over the years that fall under that child care development block grant money um, because there's almost always something that's related to health. Um, and I think that's where it's, it's the understanding the, the 309 page state plan that currently exists, it requires like digging into it to say, oh, that's a good idea, but that's not how I see it being implemented, right? And so I think sometimes the admin, how would the division of childcare and the staff know if they don't get that kind of feedback loop? So that you may get, they get data on whether the training was, um, you know, on the, on the evaluations that we provide for training, but it may or may not reflect exactly like this met the need I had at the moment, right? And so I think that's why being a part of this process is super important. Okay, I think Emma, if you're ready, we can uh, get back to policy questions towards the end. Okie dokie. 
Um, so my section is all going to be about how we can be stronger and louder together. So I just wanted to tell you a little story first about how I came to be in the position I am now. You may have noticed from my accent that I'm not from Arkansas. Um, <laughs> I moved to Arkansas from England four years ago. And in about three weeks, four years ago, was my first ever training. And the presenter was Miss Gina Dickey. Uh, and she was teaching me all about how a bill becomes law. So this is like some sort of magical fate that we're in this position now. Um, and I distinctly remember watching the Schoolhouse Rock video and my mind just being like blown about all this information. So I'm ever grateful for Miss Gina. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, AICA as, a, as what our mission statement is in terms of helping early childhood, not just educators, but the actual children themselves and the families. Um, AIC has been around for over 50 years. We have over 1,500 members. And this particular statement is our new statement for 2021. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some of the wording that we've used. So connect, develop, and represent. We, we're here to help you with whatever your needs are for the workforce. Um, having that diversity, equity, and vibrancy, I love that word so much in there. We've, we've put that in there because we want that to be our focus. Our focus is on making you guys better at what you do so that you can explain it to the people who can actually change and have an effect on what we do. Um, we promote high quality care and education through the Teach Scholarship, which you can find out more about on our website. It's basically um, a scholarship to give educators the chance to go back to school and get their associate associate's degree. Um, it's a really cool program. We've had lots of success with it. Um, but yeah, I just, when I think back to being a new person in Arkansas, having an early childhood background, but not knowing anything about the particulars of Arkansas, if AICA can help me, who knew absolutely nothing about licensing uh, regulations, nothing, then they can definitely help you. <laughs> Um, so linking back to what Gina was saying earlier, what we want our early childhood educators to do is what you already do best, and that's teach. Uh, we know that you teach children, we know that you teach parents and families, and now we just want to expand those teachability skills even further to legislators and other players in the game. Um, and for the regular people who are watching this now, um, you know, there's a reason you signed up to this meeting and we're just so glad that you're with us and we're excited to get you on our team and have us all singing from the same song sheet. So the five things for in five minutes that you can do, uh, like I mentioned earlier, joining our association helps you stay in the loop with all the current information. We do all the hard work for you and it's just zoop, on an email, uh, a blast on social media, on our website. Um, the, it's such a bargain for what you get. Like sometimes, I think sometimes people think that being a member of an association means you get to go to the conference that happens once a year. Well, our association, we are having a virtual conference this year and it's happening every other month or so. And it's so, it's so interesting to me to see how flexible we can be to meet the needs of the people that we serve. And when you remember, you get so much more than just the conference because you get that support for when times are tough. You get the, the celebrations for when the good times are happening. You know, we share all the good work that educators do across Arkansas. Um, and like I was saying earlier with Teach and just the advocacy work we do, you know, we're doing that to improve standards of care and quality of life for young children. Um, we help with your professional development, you know, sharing articles, sharing journals. Um, we contribute to the provision of those educational resources and services for young children, um, sharing all the cutting edge information, quality research. There's so much you can get out of it. And the, the bonus thing that I got from being a member was just all the networking, making those connections, our local affiliates, are hosting a lot of virtual meetings now so we get to see each other from all over the state and it's just it's such an exciting place to be right now um and i just feel like with this opportunity to work with kids count coalition as well you know that's another 
association that being a member of is really beneficial. Um, yeah, you know, they, they do things just like we do, children's policy summits, lobbying, uh, advocacy training. I just feel like this is the time to really come and join us and be a part of that yourself. Uh, so another thing you can do in five minutes is to help be part of getting that louder, stronger voice together and singing us singing from that same song sheet. Uh, you may remember me and Gina were laughing about this um, in the olden days, having a telephone tree where you had 10 people that you'd call. So uh, you might have, I remember at school when I was uh, in the classroom, our telephone tree consisted of the head teacher would call the teachers if there was a snow day and then the teachers would call the teaching assistants and then it would filter out like that so we thought that that might be a good system if you can find your 10 people whether you use a telephone or whether you use social media email that's up to you but um just passing that message on you know whenever we ask you to share something if you already have those 10 people in your head and then they can share with their 10 people and they share with their 10 people. It just makes us have that louder, stronger together um, voice. And we also want to use it as a way to quickly mobilize our members. Um, whenever there's a vote that needs passing or something that needs sharing, calls to email, calls or emails to legislators, it can, it can be so much easier if you already have that, those 10 people in your head. Um, it just helps us notify them of all those meetings, resources, things we want to share that eventually will help our sector in that professional way. Uh, so the next thing you can do within five minutes is you can jump onto this website, type in your zip code and it will bring up your representative. Um, and I know sometimes when when we ask you to do things like this, it can feel a bit like, oh, oh I'm not really sure. So I'm literally going to show you how quickly this can be done. If someone can give me a thumbs up that they can see that screen. Thank you, ladies. So imagine I've just typed this in, type, 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 type. And then I'm going to put, I've already, <laughs> you can see I've done this before. But if I put my zip code in, click on that, and boom, it's done. And all his contact details are here, website email, nice little map. So if you need to find your representative, that's literally how long it takes. And then you can save that contact information within your own email address system or however you wanna do it. So that when we are asking you to send information to them, it's already there, it's saved, it's done. And it takes, that was probably less than two minutes actually. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to make you aware that it is really that simple. And then of course, actually sending the email. Um, so after you find out who your representative is, you can send an email, a letter, a phone call, whichever one you feel comfortable with or all three. Um, but what I wanted to highlight is that when I did it in the last round of uh, advocacy, I felt so disappointed when I didn't hear anything back. And I talked to Gina about it because I was like, well, what's the point? There's no point doing it. They're never gonna listen to us. But she very, <laughs> kindly explain to me how it all works with the, the legislators seeing all these hundreds of emails from different people. So one thing that we want to encourage you to do is to highlight that subject line. If we can use the same words and the same phrases in the subject line, when that legislator is scrolling through their email inbox, the more they see the same words, it will eventually stick somewhere. Um, and <laughs> I remember getting um, an email back that basically it read, it, it, it was like a red receipt. And I was like, that's still not good enough either. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted so much more. But yeah, so don't, don't be discouraged. You know, um, those, those same subject lines over and over are the thing that is going to get their attention. And then when it makes a difference is when they do something about it. But they can't do anything about it if we don't have their attention. Uh, and then one of the easiest things I would say you could do is when you're sharing your social media, um, just to make your post public and add some hashtags, because these are the hashtags that our legislators look at. Um, 
even when you're, if you think about, if you have an early childhood uh, program and you have a private Facebook for families, obviously we don't want you to go and share that publicly, but the text that you write and maybe some of the photos, you know, you have your own social media policies, but maybe some of the photos can be shared along with some text and you literally just copy and paste it into a public post and add those hashtags. Because if you're, if you're already doing the work with sharing with the families what amazing brain builder people you are, adding that hashtag just lets more people know. Um, and then hopefully it'll just become like second nature really to post it to your own page. Um, what we're going to do uh, in February is we're going to set you a little challenge, which I'm going to talk about next. So we're going to have a 28-day challenge where we basically want you to share with us, as in AICA and the wider world of the internet, um, all those things that you do day in and day out that make you a professional and, like Gina said, not a babysitter. You know, we get frustrated when you know, folks don't understand that we are actually brain builders and that we're not just sitting on children. Um, and it takes a lot of skill to be able to do that day in, out, day in and day out with young children, especially when we talk about using play as that primary tool. So we need you to help us help them understand what that entails every day. Um, the hashtag that we've come up with is hashtag key players. And you can see the play has been um, highlighted there because we want these legislators to know that we are the people who are creating the people who will run this country in the future like I always used to say to my staff you know there could be a prime minister in our midst and we just don't know but we're not going to give them that opportunity unless we are the people making the difference and you all do amazing work across the state of Arkansas in my role as VP of communications I've seen so many different types of early childhood settings and they're all doing different things so we want to see those and share them so that we can do even more amazing things and like Gina was saying earlier the the people that we're trying to get the attention of might be the regular people but they have children they have grandchildren and although they might not get it they understand what it's like to be a child. They were a child one day. I know it's hard sometimes to imagine that, but these people <laughs> are real human beings and they were children one day. They have lived experiences of being a child. So if we can connect them to what children are experiencing now, it just makes it more impactful. So we're gonna ask you to stay tuned for our 2021 policy agenda that's coming out, hopefully next week. Uh, members who of Arika will receive an email probably by the end of Monday with this agenda in and then non-members can visit our website after but we do encourage you to join us um it's a wonderful wonderful association and I personally have got so much out of it over the last four years and this this project that we're doing especially in February with the 28 day challenge just gets me so excited I'm like why is it not February now um but yeah, we just really encourage you to, to share what you know and be stronger and louder together because that's, if you think about, especially during the pandemic, that's the only way we're gonna get through this together. So we're just gonna really, we're here for you, but we also need you to help us support you. It's like a lovely cyclical thing that happens. And that's it. Like if you have any questions, comments, let us know. I don't know if we've got any right now, Rebecca, I'm gonna mute myself. I um I went back and looked, Rebecca, at a couple of things that I felt like didn't get um we didn't cover. So the organiz the one thing similar to the organizational chart on a statewide. So definitely seems to be a homework item that we need to do. And Emma and I've had on our uh, to-do list for months that we would have a policy tab at AECA. And so um, I'm adding that to our list of things that should be uh, included. Um, but And then combined with that, the relationship that ECE has with K-12. And it's um, almost, we don't, right? And it's, it's, it, it seems very, very dependent on the governance structure of a state. So some states 
the Department of Ed oversees child care. Um, and in other states, it's differentiated like it is with us here. And at the federal level, it's differentiated. So there's the early childhood falls under the Department of Health and Human Services, and then there's the Department of Education. And I think there, there has been some work to do a better job of aligning that over the last probably eight years, 12 years. Um, and it is better but it's still got a long way to go. It's like somehow when they turned five, they were someone else's responsibility and nobody kind of knew what was happening before that. So, you know, I think there's some opportunities for us to do as far as a field goes where we can have a better kindergarten transition from early ed to kindergarten, right? Those one-on-one -on -one relationships that a pre-K teacher might have with a kindergarten teacher probably helps understand what some of the things that have been going on. Um, but as far as that goes, it really isn't. Even our certification now, when it was updated, it used to be um, a P4, and then we moved from a birth to K and a K. So there's an overlap that's really slight. Um, and in fact, it's kind of kind of uh, carved us out a little bit into K-12 because I could hire a teacher with the other certification and use her in more places than I could my BK teacher. So even though she might be perfect for my pre-K classroom and my kindergarten classroom, I can't really move her up into second grade if something happens and I need her there. So um, back to the governance thing. Um, a couple of things that Emma said that made me just think about was, um, um, well, no, Kristen. Kristen said the just play, even as a therapist, which makes me sad because I'm like, I can see why I'm having trouble. But if if a therapist is getting that same kind of feedback. So I think it does speak to the fact that we really, really have to educate regular people that play is a tool and that play is a verb. Um, and it's and when we use that terminology, we don't mean recreational. Right. Because, you know, as a grown up, I might go, I'm spending my Saturday playing outside and I mean recreational. And so you can imagine why people are, you know, confused about that. And so I do think um, if you're a social media user and um, please follow Emma's posts on the 28 day challenge, because really the purpose of that is to educate people on play and getting that from all kinds of people throughout the state. And then the nice thing about um, using the hashtag that Emma can curate that. So not only are you getting it out to the world in which you have, but you know she can be looking at that hashtag and repost some things from AECA. So it's an experiment. It's a grand experiment that we're trying. We've really never done something at that for that at that big and that many days in this sort of coordinated way. Um, but we hope it's the first of many to come. So I'll stop talking and see if anybody else has other questions. I got a, uh, a few direct messages. One was asking essentially, what do you think are the biggest issues um, in early childhood education impacting young children and their families? Um, the retention of qualified staff. Um, our, our programs are as good as the people in them. So in our state, we focus a lot of attention on the environment. We use the environment rating scale um, and, we, and we, we're rocking that. But we all know that no matter what you have in the classroom, it's as good as the people that are there to facilitate that learning with children and the relationships. Um, and so that's where this is really, really tricky because um, the, when I talk to directors, it's like you hire the most qualified person you can afford, right? I'm sorry that I have to give that like qualifier at the end, right? We'd like to hire the most qualified person we can find. Um, and so until we as a nation, because I can assure you the state of Arkansas does not have the resources to help us pay our people better. They just don't, we don't have that kind of money that until as a nation, we decide that, you know, when you, this is the rhetorical question, and maybe this is, we should add this as number six, you can do in less than five minutes. <laughs> but I'll be talking to someone and I'll say, so why is it that when children turn five, they are, their education is considered the public good and that we as a, as a society support that. But when they were four, it was their parents' responsibility. 
And people will just look at me and go, I don't know. And I'm like, no, it's not rhetorical. This is not like a quiz. This is a why, why do we decide this arbitrary cutoff, right? And so, um, yes, early childhood is technically zero to eight. And it would be lovely if there was that coordination with K-12 because we know that children learn in the exact same way as second graders as they do if they're three on their feet, not in their seat. But that's not how that's not how the system flows. So, um, yeah, staff, staff, and staffing, and the support of that. Um, so, what we didn't say about the agenda, we really have three major items. The foremost is maximizing the federal resources. Right, new money has come down through COVID spending. We have a, a two-year process for the state plan is coming up, so AECA will focus on how to maximize the resources that are available to us. The other two items on our agenda are expansion of the TEACH program. We received money from the Division of Child Care, AECA, um, as part of the Child Care Development Fund, and it's, it gave us the seed money to get started, and we have 55 scholars, but that's that maxes out the budget. So expanding that, hopefully with other resources, either philanthropic or state or all the above. And then the third one is providing, um, we really are focused on this providing adequate compensation. And so whatever conversation that's had at the national level being involved in that, looking next in the next two years for the tax credit, but also um, we are officially supporting the Working Taxpayer Relief Act, which is Senate Bill um, 10, I'm not used to things having only two digits, Senate Bill 10 by Senator Dave Wallace. Um, it would not provide income for all of our staff. It would certainly be of benefit to staff who are single parents, which is a lot of our staff, um, and many, many, many of our families. So that's a, a being led by another coalition and AECA is signed on to support that. So Working Taxpayer Relief Act, Senate Bill 10. Um, is what's part of the current agenda that we're supporting. So we had a, a, a few other questions. Um, I think this was in relation to uh, the, uh, the play therapy, who, uh, how and who qualifies for those programs. Kristen would have to answer that, I think. Was it maybe asking about teach? Oh, maybe she was asking about teach. Sorry. Yeah, yes. I, just, I just dropped the link in oh. the chat just in case anybody wanted it. Oh, good. Yeah, there's some really great uh, information on the AECA web blog about the teach program. Uh, I just but any to say as, as, oh, sorry, Gina. No, no, go ahead, Emma. Um, I just wanted to say as well with uh, the, prom the promotion of play as the way that children learn, the pandemic has offered a really good opportunity for us to teach parents because when the children are at home and parents are pulling their hair out, like, what do I do? They don't have access to worksheets. They don't have, you know, the, the time to sit down and be the teacher. But if you tell them, you know, get some Play-Doh, get some loose parts, set it up like this, that kid will be happy for hours and they can sit and do their Zoom meetings and, you know, get a break. And I just think that this 28 day challenge is just going to highlight play even more. And the more stuff you can send us, like Gina said, the more we can lay it and send it back out. I want to, I want to respond to Terry's post about federal and state programs having advantages for compensation because when those are created, they're built in, right? It's part of the formula for how to fund ABC or part of the formula for how to handle Head Start and done in a way that we knew would be beneficial, right? That you could afford an, a, a person with an associate. And that goes back to this sort of, um, we're not, we're not a system. We keep calling ourselves a system, but if I'm a faith-based organization that can opt out of being a part of Better Beginnings because of religious concerns about that, and I'm a for-profit that was, you know, is fee-based entirely and doesn't take vouchers because of its inconsistency with children's attendance and being able to bill for that. Like it's, there's nothing in our structure that weaves all of us together except for licensing, right? And licensing is minimum licensing. So nothing that really supports quality. And what I've been saying to legislators for the past three years 
is that child care fought, we have put child care into a free market system and it doesn't work. Like you want to believe it works because, you know, we love free market and we love capitalism in our country. And my husband's a banker down the hall working from home. <laughs> like I'm not anti-free market and anti-capitalism. I live with a guy. But this system that is reliant upon fees from parents and then we are only reliant on what the parent can afford to be able to pay our staff, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. And a child's quality should not depend on the zip code they live in or the salary their parents are making. We don't do K-12 that way. Well, we do a little bit, but we have a, an infrastructure that supports K-12 across the board, as well as higher education. So from K until you, know, you graduate, we can talk about the cost of college, but no child is paying the full cost of college, right? It's underwritten by the state, it's underwritten by the federal government, the, the system. Our system does not have that same structure. We do it child by child through vouchers and through that set aside for quality to support the system. But from a, um, a business standpoint or from an economic sector, we do not have that support. So we just have a minute left. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, Gina and Emma, are you willing to share your contact information with people? That's, it's on the slide. Yeah, please oh, feel right free. Oh, right me. There it is. Yeah. Happy, happy to take any kind of questions or um, you want to join the movement, then uh, we're still figuring out what that looks like, but let us know. Well, we appreciate everyone participating today and big thanks to Gina and Emma for leading this great discussion. Um, we hope you all enjoy Kids Count Week at the Capitol um, and that you're all ready to go and advocate on these important issues that we talked about and so, even some issues we didn't talk about that impact kids that you know and care about. So thank you so much. Uh, take care and have a good rest of your week. Bye.